in my brain, I had this limiting belief that you should always be striving for better. He's like, no, you can be the best. You can find ways to be the best dad now. And let's make that happen. So yeah, that's kind of the answer to your question. Like I, I just changed that whole hierarchy and put myself first and I do it in a way that is selfish. It is because if I don't spend time for me and if I don't know who I truly am and if I don't like being with myself, my wife's not going to want to be with me for sure. Off air, uh, my guest and I, Jeremy, were just discussing uh, his his incredible life, what he has uh, climbed out of. And one of the consistent things that I want to discuss in general is for us is when did the family come into the picture? When when uh, Jeremy was overcoming the things that he was overcoming, uh, at what point did the wife and the kids and stuff like that come into uh, come into the picture. So, uh, Jeremy, please let's just continue that conversation we have in off air. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, Jay, everyone has their stories. Everyone has their struggles. Most people don't share their stories. Most people don't share their struggles because they're like, oh, mine's not special or enough. That fear of not being enough, that fear of not being able to provide enough or give enough, that was exactly what was holding me back from having a family for, I mean, until I was really 31, 30, right? My whole twenties. I'm, I've always been good with kids, other people's kids. I, I love kids, but I did not believe I was a good enough father to have children. I didn't believe I was patient enough to have children. I didn't believe I was rich enough to have kids, which is really stupid by the way, man, because these are, these are dumb limiting beliefs, but they were mine. <laughs> other people might have their own limiting beliefs, they hold them back from other aspects of life. But for me, just having a child, I did not feel even remotely adequate to be in that position. I didn't feel like I was going to be calm enough or loving enough, which is asinine because I think if anyone who knows me, I really, from the depths of my soul, care about people extreme, to an extreme depth. And yeah, I just didn't feel worthy what in all the, aspects. What, what happened? Like, what was the work that you put in? Um, you know, what, what did you discover in, all right. So we're looking at 30, you're 30 years old. Like what happened? What did you do? Like what, what was the, the, the flip that was switched? <laughs> there was, there was a switch, man. <laughs> there was a switch. So I'll give you three answers to that question and there won't be entirely long. Answer number one is accidentally, uh, I was going down a really, really, deep, dark path with mm. psychedelics, with drugs, um, kind of pushing my body to those limits to kind of find out what, what was in there. I wasn't doing it on purpose, but it was happening. And through that process, I was learning a lot about myself and a lot of the fears that I have and a lot of the, the demons that I battle. Um, number two, I was dealing with alcohol. I do not consider myself an alcoholic, but it was a point where it was a very big struggle for me in the sense of I would just drink when I was sad. I would drink when I was alone. I would drink when I was by myself and sad, <laughs> blend both of them together. And it wasn't something that uh, I couldn't, un I couldn't stop. It was something that I just felt the need to do anytime that I had free time. And then number three was also a physical journey, right? I didn't really have, I wasn't in shape. I was a shape, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yep. if that makes sense. And all three of those things kind of all started to compile on each other together because that's when I realized I had to, I, I wanted some counseling. I wanted some help. I wanted some assistance. It was the day I hired a woman named Libby. So Libby is a counselor who lives in Canada. Never met her before. She's just someone who has a few degrees and is a really, really Excellent, excellent question asker. And here was the big moment, Jay. I remember, man, extremely clear. I was on a walk. Me and her were on the phone. We were talking about my battle with alcohol and why I do it. And what the revelation that I came out and understood of myself was, and this is probably why most men drink to the extent that they do, although they might not necessarily be addicted to alcohol, what they are doing is they're doing what I did which was 
being average, being normal, being the regular every day-to-day citizen where I was dampening my light so that other people what? couldn't see me. I was dampening my greatness so this other people This is something that you and me. I both have incredibly in common. So um, I have a suiting company. This is a custom suit. I've got Shine Your Light under my, under my collar here. I have the Marianne Williamson quote right here. I look at it every Let's single go. day, and this is the meaningful quote here. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, but our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure, right? Uh, uh, I will not read the whole thing here. I will put it in the description for everybody to, to read. It's a wonderful guiding principle, I think, in your life. What I'm really curious about here is that I think today a lot of men confuse the average with one area of their life. And in general, that's income. Mm. But I don't think from, mm. from this discussion, from what you're saying, that I don't think it was income because if we know a little bit about you, income's not the challenge. So what do you think? Yeah. What, like when it comes to what men are dealing with, what fathers are dealing with this average pedestrian lifestyle, what would you say would be that piece that they need to work on? What is, in your experience, what is it? Doing hard things. Yeah, physical. Doing hard things physically. Getting creative and figuring out what's hard for them. Because for some men, like going to the gym and benching 350 pounds isn't that hard. But to them, a lot of them are my clients, by the way. I work with a ton of like special forces, right? Military, men and women, uh, but mostly men who are extremely physically strong, right? Just absolute badasses. They could kill you with a grape but they've never prayed for more than an hour straight or they haven't gone and did a, a three, four day silent retreat or meditation, or they haven't gone three weeks without any type of substance, no nicotine, no caffeine, no drugs, no alcohol of any kind, right? L- really hearing themselves and feeling all the emotions. That one, that one is the, in my opinion, the one that's, if you're going to try to break through that average, the feeling of being, Mm, subpar, mm, decent, eh, like everyone else at the party. If you have a depth and a character to which you're able to very easily cry in front of other individuals, maybe on stage, maybe in front of your wife, maybe in front of your kids, where you're not feeling like strange about it, you don't feel weird about it. If you can do that, that's hard. That's doing hard things for sure. And that's extreme, extreme power. What did you do? to cultivate that skill? First and foremost, I embraced full sobriety for many years where, um, so that sobriety journey started about 27 and a half ish. Um, and so that, that two to three year journey up into my thirties where everything was like, Oh wow, I think I finally got it (laughs) is when I started embracing the family, the family structure of my, of my life. But, really going into full sobriety. So no stimulants of any kind, no Advil, no Tylenol, um, no caffeine, nothing, just water and food. No, no Coke. I try my absolute best. I even contain sugar, nothing. Just, just as pure as I could possibly feed my body, which gave me just ridiculous amounts of energy, man. Uh, the first week was a challenge, but the second, third, fourth, like I got leaner. I was looking great. I had all this energy. I didn't know what to do with it. So I started signing up for physical endurance events. As crazy as that sounds. I signed up for, um, in 2018, an event called 29029, which is Everesting. There's a guy by the name of Jesse Itzler and Colin O'Brady. They came up with this thing where they rent out a ski slope. You heard about this. Okay. Uh, cool. For the, for the listeners, please, and, uh, please keep, please go on for the feel yeah. good fathers that aren't familiar. You said Jesse Isler. He's um, yep. a fantastic personality. Great and man. a lot of, like I've, I've newly fallen in love again. He talked about the life resume. I'll, I'll put a link down in the description for everybody uh, to consume that, but please continue telling the story about this event. Yeah, he's just, he's a great man. He, and he is, he's a father, I think a father of three or four, if I'm not mistaken. And he just shares his life. He shares his struggles. Because again, income, not one of his specific challenges, but he has other challenges. Everyone has their challenges. Everyone has what they battle through. 
did this event and it's like, it's like $4,000, man. Like it's not the cheapest events you can go to. And it's, it's fucking hard, dude. <laughs> You're climbing this mountain for 36 hours and it's the equivalent elevation gain of Everest mm-hmm. in a weekend. So you're getting up at 6 a.m. Friday morning. I and mean, that's, that's when it starts. So you're getting up at four, three or four or five was the latest. And you're climbing all weekend long. And we're not talking just a normal climb. This is a steep mountain. So you're, you're having Olympians and Ironman that are dropping out. And then you, you have me who I've never done anything in my life physical at all. And I put a lot of money on the line and I, get, I kind of like my reputation in a way. And I did end up finishing and I've gone back every single year to do another one. And I will c- probably continue to do so for quite a while. But that was really a sense of accomplishment that I never had. And when I got to the top and I finished my last race, I was absolutely in tears, man. And it was a really, really exciting feeling because for me and for all the other fathers that are out there listening, all the other great men, we have to find ways to go deep, deep, deep into our soul because we can only ascend into heaven as down into hell as we're willing to go. Mm. One of the big things that uh, you just said that I really, really love was uh, there was a sense, part of the sense of what you built was that you said you were going to do something and then you did it. And so as a principle that, you know, like I, I just call that integrity. Like you put your yeah. reputation on your own, it, you, you intone it, you, you, you put it out into the world and then you accomplish it. And that's something that, um, I think as a, as a race, we have, we have a challenge with, uh, in general, is that, um, where else have you applied that, um, in your life? All of them to, to the highest degree possible for a lot of my men and a lot of the fathers, when it comes to our relationship with our perfect wife, if there's any intimate issue, intimacy issues, or if there's any challenges or struggles with like her, her calling you out in front of people or just kind of being mean to you or feeling like she's giving you the cold shoulder a lot. Oftentimes that's a trust issue. I mean, like 98% of the time it's a trust issue. And it's because she's harbored or built up tiny, tiny, tiny blocks of resentment for the last three or four years because you haven't done certain things that you said you were going to do when you said you're going to do them. Now, granted, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes, dude, obviously, right? Everyone's imperfect. But if you can call yourself out on those things, she's like, hey, can you take out the trash? And you're like, yeah, sure. And you just totally forget. <laughs> it's not her fault. And it's not because you're too busy, right? It's not because something came up. You have to apologize for that, ask for forgiveness, and then do your absolute best to take out the trash. Set a reminder on your phone. Do whatever you need to do. But do certain things because that is a trust issue, right? That's what men are supposed to do. I mean, a real, true man who is full of integrity and knows his path and his purpose, my guy, we're absolutely going to do our best to say something and then go do those things. And it doesn't have to be climbing Everest. For a lot of us, it can be going, hey, baby girl, this week, I'm going to go walk three miles every single day for this week. It can be something basic, simple, and easy as that. And then when she sees you do it, and when your children see you do it, you're going to be building up trust through your actions. And that's the most powerful thing I think, I think that we can do as men. That's lovely. Yeah. Um, completely agree. And for feel good fathers, that's a great way to, to, to build it. You mentioned, uh, it's like build up your family. You mentioned family structure. <laughs> I'm really interested in, in what you mean here. Cause what you, you were saying something about you had this intention behind what the family was. That was kind of like what you were kind of pointing at. So can you walk us through what you mean here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the family structure and the arrangement of family for me is a little different than a lot of people might consider because a lot of dads are going to go down the initial direction that kids are most important then wife, yeah. then probably work, then probably God, maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and then your sports team. <laughs> I, I don't even know where you are on this list, right? You're somewhere, but it's low. It's real low. Your boss is definitely higher than you are, and your wife and kids are definitely higher than you are. For me, and this is going to sound selfish because it is, I am number one on that hierarchy. It is me first, always, then my wife. 
than my kids. When you start shifting this paradigm a little bit, because you don't make your whole life about your kids. I love my two children. I have two sons, Gabriel, who's 13, and Jason, who's 19 months. And uh, yeah, say hey, that's uh, we're going to talk about this that 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 separation. I, I have a, a an eleven, and I have sorry, I have a ten turning eleven, and a four month old. So my man, the same, the same kind of there thing. There we go. We yeah. got the spread. Yes. So I I love my two sons, and obviously they're incredibly important to me. And I would drag my broken legless body over a mile of glass to do anything for them at any point in time but I'm still the most important person in my life because if I'm not full and energetic and exciting and great to be around and fun and picking up my kids and putting them on my shoulders and doing all the things that dad should do and holding them as often as I can, you're not a great dad. And I had, uh, I have a father figure that I look up to when I say father figure, like another dad who I just admire. His name is Josh Brock. He lives in North Carolina and I'd love to get him on your show at some point. Uh, his wife is a, Huge, huge, huge influencer on Instagram. And this dude is a Viking. The best dad that I know. I mean, 10 out of 10, right? He's all tatted up, UFC fighter. Just the coolest, best dad. Always giving so much to his kids. Always available for them. Writes them letters all the time. You know, has drawings. Just has play dates, dad and daughter dates. Just so cool inspires me and he told me and he we, we were in a hot tub once uh me and three other guys boys in Lacroix, and he challenged me he was asking me the questions like how would you rate yourself as a dad and i was like probably a nine he's like cool let's get you let's get you to 10 yeah because <laughs> i i in my brain i had this limiting belief that you should always be striving for better he's like no you can be the best you can find ways to be the best dad now and let's make that happen. So, yeah, that's kind of the answer to your question. Like, I, I just change that whole hierarchy and put myself first. And I do it in a way that is selfish. It is. Because if I don't spend time for me, and if I don't know who I truly am, and if I don't like being with myself, my wife's not going to want to be with me, for sure. That's the... You're, I'll, I'll just say you're not alone. That, that is the primary relationship you have to have. So many people are so many fathers, very, very specifically. I meet a lot of people where they can't fill their own cup. This is one of my own struggles, just learning how to fill my own cup. Because in, in my work and similar in your work, I, I work with people, I build other people up, but if this isn't full and if I'm not happy with, with this person, it doesn't, it, I can't give, there's a limit to the amount that I can give. <sighs> and, um, uh, the wounded healer is an archetype, right? Like we're all kind of wounded there, but um, there's a reason why the expression is hurt people, hurt people. You got to mm. kind of be the king to everybody that you're helping. You got to mm. kind of be able to lead them in a meaningful way, either um, as peers or as, as a consultant, coach, mentor, et cetera, like that. Absolutely love it. Um, your background is in, uh, you have a very unique background. Um, <laughs> and to learn more about that, I will put the links again, more links into the description here for you to kind of consume. But Jeremy, there's something very specifically that I think I'd love to hear you talk about, which is the money, the investing, that side of raising your sons, raising your family and bringing this mm -hmm. conversation in here. Cause there's an interesting mm -hmm. backstory. Let's do that super quick and then talk about how you brought those learnings and how you're raising uh, your sons and then how you're running your household to impart like this hard one wisdom. Sure. Dang, man. That's good. That's a good question, Jay. So, but I mean, the background in general, I'll give you a super fast, nice overview. When I was 12, I asked my dad, like, what should I do with my life? Because uh, we had just sold some of our Apple stock that we bought. So I bought some Apple shares in 1994 after watching the movie Forrest Gump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and me and my dad sold those shares in 2000, made 12 grand, which was a $32 million mistake. And I asked my dad, like, hey, what should I do in my life? Because I'm, I'm so jacked, right? I'm 12 with $12,000. I mean, I, I felt AC for the first time, like seven months before getting 12 grand. So I'm feeling on top of the world. And he says, you need to study money. That's what you need to do. But he didn't know how to tell me how to do it. 
he just said, do it, go to college, get a finance degree. Like that was what I was imagining. He didn't tell me to read the books. You know, he, he just kind of just said, Hey, go study money. That's what the rich people need to do. That's what, if you want to be rich, that's what you need to do is study money. So I did, I ended up getting a finance degree at the university of Florida, go Gators. And they didn't really teach me anything about the stock market. It was a lot of accounting and economics, which is cool and other random classes, but it wasn't any stocks or day trading or options or investing. It wasn't what I was looking for. So I still ended up getting my degree, but I went full circle to just learn as much as humanly possible through webinars, books, and in-person seminars. And I studied my face off like an absolute monster for years and years and years. Super quick, Start, super yep. quick. Yep. Three books that you cool. read in that time, three influencers, three people to follow uh, just from that time period. Oh, absolutely, man. If you ever want to get a great workout, run up some Napoleon Hills. Got it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, man. Napoleon Hill, of course. That's the, the goat. And then Tony Robbins, a book called Money Master of the Game. And then Jen Sincero, her book is called You Are a Badass at Making Money. Got it. Uh, so if you read anything about Napoleon Hill, you're good. Uh, Outwitting the Devil, of course, or Think or Grow Rich, of course. And then My Master of the Game and yeah, Jen Sincero. Those, those, those books will change your life for sure. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for asking, ma'am. Um, but I did. I mean, those, those are three to mention, but I've read probably at this stage of my life 400 or so books on just money, money and investing. I got a book right there called how to beat wall street uh, by Myron Kendall. I mean, I've, I've read so many books just about investing in stock. I just loved it, man. The big, big thing, my very first, like full actual trade, I typed into Google, which silver stocks to buy because I heard on CNBC that silver is going up. First stock that pulls up was first majestic silver ticker symbol, a G still around today. I had $9,000 in my 401k. I worked at a Fortune 500 company called Nationwide Insurance. I took that money in my 401k. I pulled it out of my retire by 2040 retirement fund, sold it, was in cash, got into a self-directed 401k in my work, which most people probably can do who are listening to this. Took that, bought stock in silver at $9. So I had $9,000 um, in my account. I bought 1,000 shares. At nine bucks, it went up to 12. I sold it, made $3,000 in, in days, which was more than I made at work at the time. So this is in my you know early 20s. That was a problem, man. <laughs> once, right. once I saw that on my screen, because no one had ever told me that me, poor boy from Georgia, growing up three minutes south where they found the movie Deliverance, didn't know what, what AC was, me could make more money trading the market than you can make it work. Mm. Once that paradigm got shifted, I was the most hungry person on planet earth. Got it. How yeah. are you bringing this to bring it back in? Yep. Great lesson. So I have, you know, I, I'm in personal development. A lot of it is online business. There is a transformation when in people, when they realize that what they're doing, they can make money. There's like, <laughs> like yeah. that light goes off. Like, Oh, I don't have to collect the paycheck. I can do this other thing. Um, wonderful. Yeah, cool. um, and it's like, and it's the weight of your own shoulders, right? You were talking about being strong. This is one of those elements of you being strong here in this facet to do that. So you have this learning. That's the story. Deeper, deeper insight down in the description. How, what are you talking about with your family? Like, what are you teaching your family? One thing is um, every other Monday, we have money Mondays. So we openly talk about money at the dinner table. Uh, I tried my absolute best to talk about income with the wife and kids. I mean, Jason, who's 18 months, they, right. I mean, he's just eating yogurt, <laughs> but it's in his subconscious. He's hearing it. He doesn't know he's hearing it, but we're talking about income. We're talking about investing. We're talking about expenses. We're talking about bills. We're talking about opportunities in the future. We're talking about what stocks are, uh, how, how to be an owner and not just a consumer. So my son, Gabriel, if anyone here has a kid, they're probably right now playing Roblox, more or less. I mean, this exact second time when you're watching this, they're playing a video game, probably. So I'm talking to him about how to buy shares of Roblox and how, how it moves. And I've, I've shown him and he knows how to use a platform called Thinkorswim, which is where I interact with the stock market. And he knows how to buy shares. He knows the math behind it. 
And so we practice a lot of math, right? Because he's in seventh grade. So when he does math, I tell him, hey, man, this math is really important for you to pass this test and pass this grade. But this is the real world math that makes the most sense. This is what you need to make sure that you know. And this is if you are intrigued and you love it, continue it. But if this, this is what you need to make sure the multiplications, right? The basic, easy, everyday, important math. So, yeah, man, we have a lot of this discussion just openly about money and I don't, I I don't want my kid to be unaware of how much money I bring in or create on a monthly or yearly basis. I don't want it to be a massive surprise. And I think that that's an extremely crucial part because I mean, me and you, I'm sure again, growing up from relatively similar backgrounds, our parents didn't talk about that, Mm -hmm. right? Most of the people, most of the guys out there listening, like your parents didn't talk to you about that. You had no idea how much they made or like how much they had in their savings or retirement account. That's important for kids to know. Um, money Mondays, all these topics, fantastic. I think, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about, uh, for this is a lot of pattern breaking, you know, we're, I'm, there are so many people I know that just don't have these conversations and yeah. it's okay. And, and, and one of the things with the feel good fatherhood community and, and being here is that like wherever you're at is okay, right? Yep. This is an opportunity to decide, Hey, do I like this or not like this? Or I want to incorporate it into my life. Yeah. So yeah, well, uh, exactly, man. I imagine that someone's at a position where they don't really love their job and they don't really love their income. They can talk to their family about that, right? They can sit down and go, hey, family, uh, quick question. You know, I was thinking the other day, I'm not extremely, extremely fulfilled in my my company or my business or my job. I think I could do better. Right. What do you guys think I should do? What business, like just have a conversation, right? Tell them, you know, I'm, I'm making whatever, $4,000 a month and I just don't feel that that really matches my value. What do you guys think? Do you guys think I'm better than $4,000 a month? Do you think I can provide more than that? Because you're only going to get the money that you provide to others. So that's, these are all questions you can ask and you just have this table and you you might be surprised that your child might have the greatest idea in the world. He just never told you. And it's a new business, right? You Maybe your 18 uh, year old son wants to start a mobile car cleaning company with you and you had no idea. And I tell people a lot, by the way, man, like mobile car cleaning companies, they're getting slept on right now. There's not a lot of them, at least where I'm at uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. And there's tons of people that need this service. Um, and I think charging like 300 bucks per car, you know, probably plus tips is relatively reasonable for nicer, slightly higher end cars. And if you do seven of those a week, all right, essentially one a day, I mean, you're looking at $8,000 a month. $9,000 a month in revenue. I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, there's almost a hundred thousand dollars a year cleaning cars and one car a day taking three hours. <laughs> you know, it's not a bad, it's not a bad, you go, not a bad outcome. Get to be a, I, I, whenever I hear this kind of conversation, I think about office space. It's like, yes, go through all this world at the very end. He's like, nah, I, I make a good income. I get to be outside. The, the weather's nice. I get to hang out with other people that are cool. Like you're, you're spot on. I think that the, yep. uh, one of the things that opened up my life a lot was, um, I think in the society, because I come from tech, so I come from programming, I come from video games and I think of, um, it took me a while to meet somebody that at, at the top of home services. And so I met somebody that had a 10 figure business in home services across multiple states. And it just really impacted me because it opened my eyes to, wow, there's just something that I never really thought about. Having your garage door fixed, fixing your fridge, fixing your furnace, all this kind of stuff. These are great, meaningful, virtuous businesses where you're adding a lot of value to people, taking care of what for most people is their largest, is their largest expense, right? Their, their home. Uh, so yeah. it's a, and when you think about, uh, when you think that, I think the thing here that we're really discussing is that, that limiting belief, what is it that you, what's the perception you have of the world? What's the perception you have of value in general, especially in this, uh, uh, theoretical, uh, dinner conversation we just had, like, oh, yep. I, I make four grand a month. It was like that, that discussion is about perception. That discussion yep. is about what do you think? What do I think? All right, let's get it in together. There's another piece in here, which is enrollment that, all right, so we're having this conversation. 
But I, I think that for feel good fathers that have never done that, that have never had these kind of conversations, it's more than just the informational piece. There's an application. There's a, um, and this is very aligned with sort of you and your character and what you've done. It's aligned with that integrity. It's aligned with that. Okay. I'm saying I'm going to do something and now I'm going to go do it. What would you say to a feel good father? And what did you do, um, to put into, uh, into the world to put into action, the things that you talked about during these moments. So good. Such a good question. Your children need to see you fail, cry or sweat. (laughs) Those three things are so important for your kids to see you do. And when I say fail, you're having a conversation and your son says, dad, maybe you can, Why don't you just go door to door and knock on the door and clean people's gutters? Okay. Well, now when your son says that and your son's seven or however old, you know, or your daughter, however old he or she is, and they give you that idea that you just are like, are you going to squash it because you're scared or are you going to go, you know what? Let me think about that. Or let's talk more about it. Why would you want me to do that? Or. How about we go to a door together and we have a conversation with our neighbor? It's about having your child see you try. Because again, most parents, most, a lot of parents just shuffle everything their kids say is like nonsense, but kids do not see the world with problems. They only see the world with opportunities. They only see perfect until they get a little older. And then we kind of dampen their... (laughs) their spirit some. So having that insight and letting them kind of guide you and letting them kind of pick some direction for you and you kind of embracing it, I think, man, is a huge, huge application and very extremely, extremely important. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, but one for me was, again, my son Gabriel loves video games. Most kids do. Perfect. Great. I learned how to play a video game with him. Simple as that. And I'm not the best video gamer. I don't really like video games and I really enjoyed them, um, which is all good. Not a big deal. But I learned how to play Super Smash Brothers. And that's definitely something that we spend time with, right? We spend probably an hour every two weeks or so sitting down and I play video games and talk smack to him. <laughs> and, and I try to crush him. I beat him every now and then, but generally he beats me. But again, man, just, just trying, right? Just showing him that you can have playful side, showing him like if you go to a trampoline park, don't be on your freaking phone all day, uh, you know, and, and sitting down on the chair, but like go play trampoline, go do things with your kids that they're doing to try to be a kid again, to try to show them what it looks like. Cause that's how you integrate, right? Integration just takes small, tiny action that's repeated over and over and over. I love the translation here. So the first being, the first being, um, I think in, in something that is really definitely should be highlighted, which is the paying attention to their interests and Mm -hmm. their habits and what they find important. And we get bogged down a lot as fathers in trying to control what they think should be important rather than being curious and just saying like, Oh, you find that interesting. When you were saying the video game story, one of my, you know, a a hero father for me is Terry Crews. And he he has this story about how uh, he recognized that he was losing his son because he didn't, they're losing their relationship because his son, again, it was a video game thing. And so what he ended up doing was uh, he bought the component pieces for a computer and then kind of engaged and enrolled his son in helping him build a video game computer so that he could play games with his son uh, and had this longer, longer term project that they were doing together to kind of reinvigorate the interest there. Sure. Great. So, That's a great one. I love that story. Yeah. Um, I love the conversations about money. What kind of conversations do you have around investing? And I'm specifically asking Jeremy feel good fathers so that you guys understand this is that Jeremy's an excellent investor. <laughs> that's his, that's his background. That's what, that's what he does. Um, what, how, what do you, how do you, ugh, what lessons, what are you bringing in? What, what kind of conversations do you have about investing? 
First lesson I talk about is how to find a publicly traded company and the difference between a public and a private company. So we have that conversation a lot. Driving around, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. So as we're driving around and we see a Chipotle, I go, all right, Gabe, so is Chipotle, is that public or private? And I mean, he knows at this point. Generally, he remembers most of the time. He'll go, oh, it's public. And I'll go, what's the ticker? So sometimes he knows the ticker. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he remembers, sometimes he doesn't. But the ticker is like how you, what you type in to pull it up in your broker so that you can buy some shares of it. So the ticker of Chipotle is CMG, Chipotle Mexican Grill. And I'll ask him what share is it, like what price per share. So these are things that like we talk about semi-often. I mean, definitely on a weekly basis. And we'll talk about the price per share, and then we'll discuss being an owner and not just a consumer. It's very, very commonplace and normal and average to just engage in the product, drink the coffee, eat the food, have the, have the car and that's it. But imagine if you buy five shares of Chipotle at a thousand dollars and those five shares a month later go to $1,300, 300 times five is 1500. You just paid for your burritos for the rest of the year. Right. Being an owner, not just consumer, Verizon, Apple, everything we interact with. I talked to Gabriel about this. If I drive by Walmart, Costco, AutoZone, O'Reilly Auto Parts, uh, there's so many companies that are public. And that's what I love is the stock market is one of the bigger mysteries in the world, Jay, but it controls your everyday life. Mm -hmm. Every single person here, if they're not massively, hugely involved in the markets, it's only because you haven't studied it. It's because you have a belief that you're not smart enough. You don't have enough time, but in full transparency, it is literally all around you it is in your fridge. It is in your bedroom. It is everywhere. Awesome. I, we have a, we have a thing where when we go to a, a place consistently, like so for instance, target, it's like, all right, well, every time I go to target, I want to buy a target share. Mm-hmm. And so every time I engage with, with something I'm consuming, I want to go buy a, sh a share of that. Um, I usually try and stick to dividend stocks. That's kind of my strategy. And, and so the, the entire goal is that eventually those investments pay for that consumption. And so I'm buying into the company and then the company eventually is paying me to consume their own products, which, Love it. and I'm fine with that. <laughs> that's, that's really fun. Uh, awesome. And there's one final thing, uh, that we, we were off air, we were talking about, um, and I think this is going to be really interesting for our fathers to hear. What's, what's this thing about saying no? <laughs> <laughs> what? Saying no? Yeah, man. We were talking about off air because it's one of the most viable things you can do is, is teach your child that everything is available, but they have to create value for it. I read a book called Money Grows on Trees. So I am unable to say that we do not have the money or we can't afford it. <laughs> those, those are things I can't say. And generally I can't afford it, but I mean, even if I can't afford it, I just don't want to buy it. Right. A blessing giving too early is a curse. Mm. If I gave, if I gave my son Gabriel a Lamborghini right now and he's 13 years old, is that, is that wise? Is that smart? Mm. I mean, I would argue under no circumstances. Is that a wise idea for me then? It's not, it's saying no, it's saying, how can you, it's saying, this is not, it, it, this is not the best time for that exact type of investment. Is there another time that's better in your opinion, asking them questions and putting it on rather than just saying like, Hey, absolutely not. I'll give you uh, another interesting example. So I have a niece and nephew named Zachary and Gabby, and they have an estranged father and my mom calls him Doug the Slug. <laughs> He's not. He doesn't listen to this podcast. I promise. It doesn't matter if he does anyway. So Doug um, is kind of like a low beat, just tr absolute white trash type of a person. And my niece and nephew were living with him probably like five years ago. You know, family drama, whatever. Not that big of a deal. But they, they were down there having a horrible time. And Doug reached out to me via Facebook and was like, "Hey, man." Um, we need a new trailer. This one's not big enough. We got, he's got like seven kids and you know, all different moms. One of those awesome kind of guys. Right. 
So he asked me, he's like, Hey, can you buy me a new trailer? And then, then using the guilt trip, can you buy me a new trailer so that Zachary and Gabri, Zach and Gab can have a new place to stay? Cause this one's not big enough and it's old and dirty and blah, 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 blah. That put me in a tough spot. So what I had to do is I had to get creative and come up with kind of like a, a plan for how that transaction should, ha should happen. Because one of my biggest fears, Jay, the, the reason that I was so afraid of wealth up until, you know, my late twenties was if I become extremely wealthy, people are going to judge me. They're going to call me greedy. They're going to call me, um, whatever, just a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of negativity there. I'm gonna lose my friends. I'm gonna lose my family because I'm gonna be rich and everyone's gonna ask me for money and I'm not gonna be able to say no because I don't wanna be a bad person and that's not a smart investment, blah, 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 blah. All these limiting beliefs that kept me from becoming really, really wealthy um, subconsciously. So I have to come up with this thing that I can say to other individuals. And in the case of Doug, I said, all right, man, here's the thing. Thank you so much for asking. I know it takes a lot of courage to ask. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two. Money grows on trees, man. I have plenty of money and I would love to give you some of it. Number two. Number three, here's the value that I need you to provide for me. Money is a, is a value of a transactional unit. It tells me that one person gives something and someone gives something else. That's how, how, what it measures. I will give you the money for your new trailer if you read two books about money and fill out the questionnaires in each book send me those questionnaires like with a photo or with pictures and I will absolutely take care of that for you. All right, Jay. So what happens? So I buy him the trailer. I don't know. I think I, what happened? <laughs> like, did he do the work? <laughs> no, absolutely not. No chance. And the crazy part is, man, when it comes to family or other individuals, I have done that exact uh, process a dozen times. Mm. And so far to date, Never once out of had pay. That's insane, right? Fascinating. Huh. I'm really trying to not be like, not judge you or anything like that, but like, I just, get it. It's fascinating. It's mind, a little mind blowing. Totally. Yeah. It's quite mind blowing. And now I, I've, some people I've taken it up, they've done it, but they generally aren't family members. They're someone else and they will, they will do that for other, you know, transactions. But it is, man, it's extremely, extremely interesting. Um, that individuals will not take that type of time and it's kind of mind blowing, but anyway, that is, that is an answer to that long, a long answer to the short question. You do want to be able to create boundaries around your money and ways to structure it so that your family knows that you have plenty, that you love working for it, that you love creating it, that you love building it, scaling it, investing it. And the thing that they might be asking for might not be the absolute best way to spend your money right now. And if they can come up with other ways to either create that, buy that, own that, invest in it, then let's have that conversation. Absolutely love it. Jeremy, if folks want to get a hold of you, they want to be introduced, they want to find out more about you, where can they find you? Whatever social media platform you all prefer. I have a really great team that will make sure that your question gets answered and forwarded to me. And then I will absolutely reply to it. I love replying to people. I love messaging people. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter, YouTube, my stock website. Uh, if anybody is ever interested, who's listening on more investing techniques, 99% of my education is free. I just created, spent hundreds of hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars building really, really high quality content. And I just give it away entirely for free with no sales pitch. So if anybody wants to check that out, um, I'll make sure that Jay posts a link below and you guys can click on it and just go to the website. Uh, it's called reallifetrading.com and get a lot of free education. Why not? You can, within within seven, seven hours, you can probably have like a associate's degree or bachelor's degree in stocks. And uh, I, I'm one of those people that think every man should be extremely, extremely comfortable. Um, in the bedroom and the boardroom, right? So the boardroom being your stocks, your business, understanding money and how it works. And I can absolutely help anyone who's listening do that. Awesome. Jeremy Newsom, everybody. My guy, welcome to the Feel Good Fatherhood podcast. Click that button. You know what the purpose is so that we can continue to enrich your life and impact you in every way possible. And also, 
because while that's going on over there, right here is the next video from YouTube. YouTube thinks this is the one you should be watching. I know it's one of mine. It's probably a great discussion and interview. Check it out. Learn as much as you can. See you next time.